my 85 seconds while I get in trouble. <laughs> So it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, see this enormous crowd. Uh, and I just want to add my appreciation to the people at uh, UCLA who've done such a good job of getting this whole thing together. So I want to talk to you this morning about a few, a few things related to that title, Interface with Efficiency and Big Data. So uh, we certainly are hearing plenty about big data. We had a tutorial yesterday and we, we looked at the last Amstead News, named the big data best thing. Quote, big data goes to politics. So definitely lots going on. And in fact, in spite of the obviously hype involved, there really is something interesting going on here. We are certainly seeing a, a surge of interest in statistics and, and significant sizes of data, new kinds of data, and all that sort of stuff. And basically what I want to do today is take a look at, uh, at us, at the things that we do, and the software that we use, and, and where it came from, and try to produce some comments, some opinions, these will all be my opinions, about um, what's important and where we might be going usefully in the future. And then I'll end with kind of permitting some examples of what I think of are really interesting things that are happening right now. So uh, let me just begin by kind of outlining the, the thesis of what I want to talk about today. So the first thing is that despite the hype, I think that big data and also other kinds of uh, intensive computational challenges really are important sometimes. And sometimes there's a, there's a significant word there that I'll introduce a little more about later on. And uh, when these things are important, uh, there are other sources of software, complementary to or uh, in exchange for what we might be doing in, in R, uh, that can help us out, that can get us beyond what we can do with the obvious techniques that you all in this room probably have made use of. But again, that helps in difficult uh, problems sometimes, not all. And the technique or the, the general philosophy of approaching these problems that I want to talk about is what I'm going to call interfaces. And I'll say a good deal more about what I mean by that. But I think that these are approaches that can provide us with significant extensions for what we can do and what we can do conveniently. And that they can be supplied effectively uh, to users of uh, users of R, users of R, the software that we're using. And in fact, the first thing that I want to assert is that this philosophy, approach to using interfaces, is central to the office. It's not something that's uh, it's just being added after the fact. And in fact, not only is it central to R, but it's been central to the software the S language and even beyond the S language that gave rise to R in the first place. And so to start with, what I want to do is take you back in time uh, and examine how that concept has really evolved into the software that we use now. So I want to take you back 38 years to Bell Labs Murray Hill to a small conference room where five of us got together for a meeting uh, trying to decide about what we then had no name for but we just vaguely called the system. We didn't really know what it was going to end up being, and we certainly didn't have um, S or anything remotely like this in mind. But we did understand what we were trying to do. And what we were trying to do, basically, was to bring the best computational facilities that were then available directly, interactively, to the use of the people who were doing the data analysis and who were doing the statistics research. Uh, and that's the, the procedure, that's the, the concept that I want to convey, first of all, because it really is the central notion behind everything I'm going to talk about today. So what I'm going to do that to start with is to show you uh, the first uh, slide, or in those days it was a view graph, uh, that appeared in the first meeting uh, that day, 30 years ago, in Bell Labs. So this is a little slide that I drew up, and uh, it's kind of an interesting slide. It has two parts to it, uh, the bottom, top part and the bottom part. And today, we're mainly going to talk about the top part, which is this. And the, this is, in fact, the concept that I want to convey. This is the, the interface concept in its original form. So to, to see why this is a relevant 
thing to look at and, and why I'm bringing it up. The first thing I have to say is that although we, I'm taking you back 38 years uh, in time, that was by no means the beginning of this computing research, either at Bell Labs or generally. In fact, starting in the early 1960s primarily, there had been a great deal of very important work done in a variety of computational areas that are relevant to us today. And in fact, uh, you are using, even though you may not be particularly aware of such things as numerical linear algebra, uh, data manipulation, sorting, uh, number generation, and basic graphics. All of those existed and had been worked on. Uh, often the, so the software involved was in the form of published listings, uh, either in just publicly available memos or in what was called an algorithm section in various journals at that time. And I had adopted the term algorithm uh, just to mean that kind of software. Now in practice in those days, that kind of software meant uh, subroutines, either written in Fortran or accessible from Fortran. So what we had at Bell Labs at that time was quite an extensive library of Fortran callable subroutines. And the technique for doing data analysis at that time was to produce a Fortran main program and run it and get the results back. Well, this was fine, and in fact, a good deal of very substantial data analysis and research was done that way. The problem was that it was a non-trivial process. Uh, in order to simply get another answer, to change your mind about something, you had to go through the whole process of generating the, the Fortran code and uh, running the job and looking for the results and finding out what you did wrong and repeating. Now, it was recognized at the time that that was really not a very efficient use of human time. So our goal was to provide a software system of some sort that would get around that, that would make the uh, computations that we had more effectively and directly available to the people who were interested in the answers to the questions. So that was the motivation, the prime motivation, certainly for me, in getting involved in this in the first place. So my qualifications, such as they were, for being in that meeting uh, was certainly not that I knew anything much about programming languages. Uh, it was primarily that I had worked in many of the areas I just mentioned for the 10 years or more previously. And so I had a pretty good idea of what we had available and what were the important computations. But then the question is, what do you do? How do you make this sort of software effectively available to your colleagues? And that's where this idea of what I then called the algorithm interface came from. So let's look at this at this particular piece of elegant graphic. Right? So in the center, we have a little circle, and the circle's called A to C. And that's what I'm using to stand for the typical Fortran callable subroutine in, in our library. So this is doing something useful. It's doing uh, some numerical linear algebra. It's generating some random numbers. It's doing something good for us. And the idea was to construct something else, which is the, the rectangle around the, the circle, uh, which here is called x a vector. And here is described as a Fortran subroutine. And the idea behind that is that that takes care of as much as possible of the interface between the interactive user and the underlying computation that you can do reasonably. And at that point, you know, we had somewhat of an idea of what that meant, but definitely nothing very specific. But the concept here was that you would build a system around a set of these algorithm interfaces. I'm not sure what I was thinking of this, but you can take as a comment here that if you were going to put a whole lot of this together into a coherent system, it's a lot easier to pile rectangles circles. Uh, I'm not sure I had that in mind. But, uh, so at this point, we, this is basically what we had. This is what we had understood about this <coughs> fundamental procedure. And remember, this is the, the, the little group of five of us who, who actually only two ended up working on it. And we didn't really know what we were doing. But over the next six months or so, this kind of coalesced into an implementation of the same idea. So uh, it's probably worth looking at that, too. Let's look at an implementation of our plan. And this is now part of the first version of F. So we start again with this idea that we have some computations that do what we want, give us the answer we want. And so that's, a, a, in this case, a Fortran subroutine. I'm sure we can actually read that, but I'll tell you what it says. So this, in particular, is a Fortran subroutine to compute a least squared linear regression. And in fact, uh, I will tell you that we had such a routine, and it used basically the same numerical procedure that you're using right now if you're doing ordinary linear regression in R, the QR decomposition of the stuff. And 
so he told it as a, from a fortune program by supplying it with a bunch of arguments. Actually, there were a few more arguments that aren't shown here, but basically like this. And in, in addition, you supplied the data. You supplied the input data, the X and Y data for the regression, and you supplied the data for the coefficients and the residuals that would be constitute the result of the computation. So it's all perfectly uh, well defined, but as you can imagine, it's a bit of a pain and very easy to get wrong. And so this was the basic algorithm that we wanted to create the interface to. In the first versions of S, and this was done by writing a function in a particular language, not the S language, but a language that we called the interface language. And that here is, in fact, the interface program for that particular uh, LS bit subroutine. And again, the, <coughs> needless to say, you don't need to worry about the details because the language has been dead for, for many decades. But I just want to take a look at the form of it and also what it does for you. It's a function, and it has a name, and it has two arguments, x and y. And it then goes and does some error checking to make sure that you haven't given it silly data. And it then constructs the uh, data required for the result. And it goes off and calls the Fortran. <laughs> so, uh, and then returns you uh, as a structure, as what nowadays we would call an object, the various results that, that you want. Now, there's a couple of points that I want to emphasize here in terms of my general thesis. One is that, uh, on the one hand, this is providing you, the user, uh, with something which is going to be a function called reg that you'll call, and it, you're calling it very much like you would call, not lm, but if you've ever used the older lsbit uh, function in, in R, it's just basically doing the same thing as that. And it's returning you an object. Uh, we didn't quite have the term object in our head in, in those days, but that's what it's doing. And the details then are being handled by, uh, the, by the interface language in this case. Right? On the other hand, notice that, uh, well, as you can see it, uh, for those in the front row, uh, notice that it's actually calling uh, Fortran 17. So it's capable of communicating directly with the underlying computation in the form that they exist. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, interface language was compiled into Fortran. Now those are in the original form very much, uh, if you think about it, just what we need to worry about today. Uh, we have some underlying computations we want to do, and we want to make those conveniently available to the user. Anyway, that was the, the first version of S, and over the next couple of years, we built that up and got used reasonably widely at the labs and elsewhere uh, at at and And beginning in the early 1980s, we were able to license that uh, thanks to the Unix operating system. Thanks to Unix in two senses. One was that we used Unix to port uh, our software to the world outside, and Unix was the first software of any size from Bell Labs that was licensed for other people to use. So we piggybacked off, off Unix, and by the early 1980s, we had a license which was essentially free, free for the cop copying of tapes to universities and other research organizations, and was charged some amount of money so that started off, and I just autographed this morning, in fact, a copy of one of the books that we wrote uh, discussing that. And it, it received you know, a fair amount of, of nice response and, and enthusiastic feedback from people, primarily in uh, some of the more active statistics departments around the, around the world. In fact. So if we look at that first version of it, uh, I want to just cite a few things that I think are important to think about here. As I said, we start off with the idea of an interactive interface for the best computation that we have currently available. And that was the, the prime motivation for doing the whole thing in the first place. And in fact, uh, just as a, as a comment, it, it had uh, a lot of what you uh, were maybe used to using right now. Uh, you can, without trying to look up old listings, you can find out what it had fairly clearly. Uh, if you go to the uh, Documentation, online documentation for the base package DNR, uh, then most of the things there that have a reference to the so-called blue book, the Becker, Chambers, and Wolf, are in fact things that were taken from S and brought into R. And those by the by and large, although some of them were later editions, by and large, those were uh, all things that were part of this original structure, original concept. So there were algorithms for these and we constructed interfaces. 
then I have to make one um, sort of important negative comment here. Notice that I've said nothing about the fact that we got together 38 years ago to design a program environment. That was emphatically not what we were doing. Uh, the fact that we ended up with a language and that it just happened coincidentally to look a little like C uh, was an after effect and part of just the, the way we sort of thought things out. S was not designed uh, as a fundamental ground up program language. And that was not the, the goal of what we had to begin with, nor was it a goal that we really adopted in any serious way at any time later. So I partly mentioned that because uh, in the last while, there's been a certain amount of interest in R from the computer science community, particularly from people who study programming languages and computer science. And that's good, I mean, it's a great thing. Uh, but I always feel a slight cautionary thought in my head about that. Um, it, the, 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 the potential for really radical improvements in R uh, comes, in my opinion, from linking it to other computational models, to other sources of software, uh, and perhaps for just some <coughs> tremendously bright idea that none of us have had so far. I would welcome people who want to analyze R and treat it as a regular programming language, but just with the caution that I wouldn't expect this to be a radical improvement on the current version of R. I'm just inserting a small editorial comment there. We'll get away. That's the end of that. <laughs> okay, so we were off. Uh, so at this point, we had, we had S out in the world, and people were using it, and we were getting feedback back from it. And I just wanted to cite a couple of comments that uh, I've treasured over the years from the early days. So uh, one of the first statistics departments that was on our, our list was one of Carnegie Mellon, and I was reported back to me that one of the, the people on the faculty there, after using S a couple of times, said, at last, a computer language that speaks my language. And that was kind of nice, because uh, whatever he exactly meant by that, that was kind of what we were doing. We were trying to create a language that was convenient for people to think in. But then come back home to, to your boss, and then you get a dose of reality. And so the, the other comment is this one from my management. So have, S is great, but serious data analysis will always have to be done in Fortran. So uh, uh, I don't actually. I'm not actually including those uh, as, uh, as all derogatory. In fact, I think that if we take them together, uh, they, they convey kind of a nice message that is part of what I'm, I'm trying to say today, that really combining those two perspectives was really uh, everything that we were all about. And I think it's still everything that we're all about. On the one hand, we want to make uh, the things that we want to do easy to do. We want to make the, as I, as I termed it in the later book, the, the transition from ideas into software. Want to make that effective and, and, uh, and, and work well. But at the same time, we don't want to give up on the serious application, the serious data analysis. We do want to be able to handle that. And so we need to balance those considerations in all of the things that we think about adding to the system. So, ideas into software, as I called it, and serious applications. The goal was, and the goal still is, to do both. And so, the rest of the time today, I want to talk about just some things to think about as, as we do that, as we try to combine serious computational challenges with the convenience and the effectiveness of the current versions of R. So, so much for history. Let's go now to R. Mm -hmm. Is that pronounced in the normal Canadian way? I don't know. <laughs> so uh, when I talk about R these days, or when I write about it, I tend to quote and, and, and promote uh, some basic principles that I think are essential in uh, anything that you do of any, of any complexity with, with the system. And so I call the, one of them the object principle. And the object principle simply says that everything that exists is an object. Everything in, in R that exists is an object. And that's more than just uh, an abstract uh, comment because as far as the implementation goes, everything is indeed an object. There is a structure in C that represents an R object. And the general technique of dealing with, uh, with R and anything you do with R must, to be really effective, needs to take advantage of the fact that everything is an object. <laughs> the expressions that you enter become an object, the things that are returned to you are an object, the software that you create are objects. So the second principle is what I call the function principle. And 
and that one just says that everything that happens with an R is a function call. And if, uh, if you look, or I encourage, encourage you to look, uh, at what actually goes on under the hood, uh, after you enter expressions and these are parsed, then everything that happens from that point on uh, has to do essentially, uh, aside from some very simple uh, operations like looking up names and things, uh, has to do with a function call. So that means, again, uh, not, not just the concept that it's a function call, but that, in fact, there is some software that is handling those function calls within, the, within R, and that that is doing everything that you need to do. Now, R is a little more complicated than S was that way, uh, because in R there are actually a few special things, primitive functions and stuff, um, but those aren't things that we can generate ourselves, and so I'm going to describe them in a moment. Then I have a third principle. One that I haven't pushed in the past so much, but I'm pushing it nowadays. That's what I call the interface principle. And that just says what I've been saying all morning so far, which is that R is built on the interface to many computations. And today I'm <laughs> calling them algorithms. The point is that R itself is not meant to be and is not self contained. It's a, a window of, actually, nowadays, it's many windows onto uh, many kinds of other, kind, of other software. So those, those, I think, are the three, the three key principles to keep in mind when you're, when you're dealing with interesting, interesting applications that are. Uh, and let's now go ahead and, and think about that a bit. So first of all, uh, the R evaluation, as I say, consists of these uniform high-level function calls. Uh, a function call, uh, very, very roughly, let's don't take this too seriously, but very, very roughly, tends to take about order of a thousand machine operations. I made some back of an envelope kind of calculations that, that give me that amount. Just that order of magnitude is what you want to keep in mind. And everything is an object. All the objects are handled internally by R and dynamically allocated and, and managed in a particular way. R has separate uh, procedures, uh, protocols for dealing with objects. Uh, and, you know, not to get too much into the details of this and all the, the, the uh, complaints and, and sharpening and everything that, that goes on, uh, the bottom line is that there's going to be lots of dynamic man memory management going on and a fair amount of copying when the copying is needed by the definition of, of the system. And all these objects, uh, I kept thinking they're, they're all part of the dynamic world. All but basic stuff, and, but just keep in mind. And as I've said now several times, Underneath the software, underneath the R software itself, are interfaces to a variety of algorithms, which were written by a great many people for a great many different purposes. Primarily, they're now port management teams and C code, uh, some of which uh, we wrote uh, uh, for ourselves, but a great many of which were written by other people uh, in circumstances that we don't really entirely understand. And as I said, uh, the, the original S design and the, and the design of R now is not primarily based on the idea that the language is going to be used to program low-level computations. So, so that's, that's sort of what you get from the, the, the fundamental principles of R and, and the implications of it for, for, doing, for doing things, for doing interesting, challenging things with it. So what does that say? Well, the first thing it says is that all of this is totally irrelevant in, in a very large fraction of what anybody does. So most of the time, your computer is sitting there idle. That's what it should be doing while you think and other enjoyable things. Uh, and occasionally it, it wakes up and does some computations for you. Uh, the fact that it's doing those computations in a relatively, quote, inefficient, unquote, manner uh, is probably not something that you would normally even be aware of. And even when you are aware of it, it may just be a, a mild annoyance. But there are occasions, of course, uh, when that it's not irrelevant. And uh, the, the limitations imposed by the fundamental principles of R uh, do imply that you can't do things as well or as fast as you would like. And at that point, my feeling, again, you know, I'm saying these things over and over because I want to emphasize this, is the right answer is, all right, let's go beyond what we currently have. Let's see what other software could do what we want to do, if any, uh, and see about making that conveniently available within the R framework. Keeping in mind, and this is important, keeping in mind our understanding of the basic design and basic principles under underlying the software that we're using. 
So this brings us back to the topic of today's topic. And what does that mean for us? Well, first of all, uh, 38 years ago, interfaces meant basic interfaces between Fortran and machines were Fortran and call order machines. But now, uh, the possibilities are much, much more extensive. And so I'm using interfaces today in quite a general way. There's the interface to other programming languages, but now not just Fortran, but obviously C, C++, uh, Java, Python, etc. Julia, C, Julia is now interface, and others. But in addition to uh, other programming languages, which are a valuable resource, you can have interfaces that are a little less obvious to other computing models. So I've, I've set, set up the principles behind R, and that's the principles behind R computing models. But for many computations, we don't need other computing models. And uh, we might, in fact, prefer a slightly different computing model. We can create interfaces to such models, even without having other languages, uh, you know, other specifically uh, chosen programming languages as, as our vehicle. And I'll talk about an example of that soon. And of course, there's lots of specialized hardware, which sometimes is useful as well. You know, CPUs and GPUs and things like that. And we can create interfaces to that as well. So I mean interface in quite a general sense. So the, uh, my, my opinion, my philosophy in all of this is that the things that we're doing are too diverse and too challenging for any one uh, magic bullet to solve them all. I think we need, like it or not, I think we have to be prepared to, to look widely, uh, to, to be, be flexible, to think, and to find uh, appropriate solutions to whatever our particular problem is. And we want to do that without throwing away the proverbial baby with the bathwater. We don't want to give up uh, what works well in R. We don't want to give up our confidence, such confidence as, as we have in the fact that the R software that we're using currently works. We want to maintain that. We want, don't want to lose that because these are only special circumstances that we're trying to deal with and we want to not be able to continue with those, these good things in the language that we've brought you know, all of us So that's, that's basically the, the philosophy. And now uh, what I want to do uh, in, the, in the next few minutes is just to uh, outline very briefly some current projects that are underway that I think are um, interesting and some actually rather exciting examples of different approaches to uh, the philosophy that I've now outlined. And I should say these are not any of these, uh, none of these is one of my projects. Tangentially associated with a couple of them, but not, not things that are worth mentioning. Uh, and, and of course, this is my view of, of each of these. And uh, so I apologize in advance to the owners of the various projects uh, when I say things that are uh, not true. You aren't allowed to, to write complaining emails to the, to the author and say, you know, Chambers said that you could do this. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, there were, in fact, two tutorials. These are both uh, interfaces to the C++ language uh, and the provision for programming in C++. And the uh, thing that I find particularly nice about them, so what they do, if you've used the interface to uh, the C code, the dot .call interface within R, uh, these are, in a very simple sense, extensions uh, to that interface. They extend it, though, in a number of very important ways. First of all, in that because you're using C++ instead of C, uh, you can make use of the facilities in C++ for uh, data for classes and for various other kinds of uh, advanced programming concepts that aren't in C, that weren't in C when, when R was created. That's important because uh, of two things. One is that it means that you can tailor the software that you're using much more conveniently to the kinds of R data that you're using. But also, if you, if you look into R, encourage you to do so, you'll find that in addition to uh, uh, just having the interface, they've done two other things that are really neat. First of all, the, uh, the interface itself, the, the low-level interface to C++ and therefore to C, has been taken uh, out of your jurisdiction and done automatically. So a large collection of, of applications, you can generate the interface to C++ 
from the C++ function that you want to call automatically. And, and our CPV will generate both the, the additional C++ code and the R code if there are three things to it. So you can turn a C++ function into an R function kind of really fast. Mostly. And secondly, uh, in, if you get into the programming in C++ itself, uh, IPC and IPC 11, particularly IPC 11, uh, provide you with a number of tools that allow you to program in C++ uh, in a very convenient way, and in particular to use a number of the concepts that you will be familiar with in our programs, uh, but to have the, the result of them be code in C++ rather than, than in R, and therefore, obviously, much more efficient for, for serious applications. So uh, I think both of those are really neat. Uh, now, and, and, and the other comment is that the second part examples of that. Uh, some of them are actually quite interestingly similar to what we did with the integrate function. So in some sense, I think of RTCP as, amongst other things, providing a modern and much more elegant version of a good old-fashioned integrate function. So uh, RCPP and, and RCP logger are both on CRAN. Uh, I think for RCPP 11, you also need to get another uh, library from GitHub, but it's all, it's all out there. Uh, go off and find the documentation and you know, really make sense. So RCPP has been around for quite a while and it's, it's really extensively used already uh, for many, many packages that use it on the CRAN. Uh, my second example is quite a bit newer. Uh, this is some work that uh, Douglas Temple Lang and, and other people have been doing, uh, which I call L LLVM for R. So LLVM is Compiler toolkit uh, that provides you with tools that enable you to define how you want to compile some language uh, and what you want to do with it, what you want to generate uh, as code that corresponds to that language. It's intended to make it straightforward to adapt uh, the, the result of that process, the result of that integrate, let's call it an integrate, uh, for the particular needs that you have. So the RLVM is a package that adapts the LLVM technique uh, for, uh, for language compilation and language uh, code, code generation adapts it to the R language. So the, the model here is that second model that I mentioned for interfaces, that you are interfacing not necessarily to some other language or some specific language, but you are interfacing from the R language into a different computing model. And so uh, the, the advantage here is that you're actually programming probably be programming in a somewhat different idiom of R than you're used to. For example, you're encouraged to use iteration, whereas in normal R you're not. Uh, but you are programming in the R language, so there's no new language to learn. The result of what you're getting for chosen suitable applications is, for example, just very efficient machine level code. So the RR, excuse my pronunciation difficulties, the RLLVM compile package uh, takes R language and turns it into some uh, highly optimized, efficient machine code. There, uh, but and, and the point, of course, is that this process is something that you can adapt to a variety of, of purposes. That if you wanted to use specialized hardware, this is certainly one way that you can generate code at the other end that would be suitable for, for that hardware. Uh, I point this actually in a very exciting direction for, for other reasons as well as what we're talking about today. Uh, because I think here is a way to build in uh, characteristics of particular applications and particular uh, data sources into the software in an automatic way. Uh, I'll just say this in a sentence because it's just some big ideas that, that Doug and I have had. Uh, it's possible, I think, to, to come with some software uh, and some data and a particular problem that you want to solve and present this to this kind of interface and have the interface generate efficient technique for doing the computations you want, and then recording the whole thing, not just not just the, the, the functions and things like that, but recording the whole thing as part of the evidence of, of the data analysis you've been doing. So this relates to such considerations as reproducible research and things like that. It's very, very interesting. Very, very new. Uh, this is not on CRAN. Uh, go to the onehatch.org uh, repository.
third example I have is uh, a package called H2O, as in water. Uh, and the, the, my interpretation of the basic ideas behind this are that uh, they have substantial amount of code, based mostly Java-based, which has been carefully designed and optimized for dealing with um, big data, seriously big data. Uh, and uh, there are a number of techniques built in. It, the first thing that they've done is to provide a data structure, a Java-based data structure, which is highly optimized for compression and for efficient processing. So it's a, a thing that would look like a data frame. It is a data frame for all purposes. But uh, in this form, it will be stored in quite a different way. Stored off uh, somewhere else, not not in R, uh, not not in memory, uh, and then from that structure, object let's call it an object, uh, statistical computations can be done, and uh, the software that they have in the H2O package makes a great deal of use of Hadoop, the general MapReduce idea, and implements a number of the more recent techniques for clustering and model fitting. It forms a, at least from the examples I've been shown uh, are really strongly efficient in terms of what we could do in, in any obvious way. So, so again, this I think is <coughs> important in the sense that we're making real use of the idea of the efficiency, the idea that there are objects elsewhere uh, which for which we have our uh, objects that act as proxies. So the, the way I tend to describe interfaces is that we, uh, we want to deal with our objects our code uh, and realize that those are proxies for objects or data structures that are held elsewhere and computations that are done by other processes. So it's really, really neat and uh, the, the people who are uh, producing it are, are very keen to have uh, people try out new ideas and, and other kinds of analysis. Again, as, as with LLVMs, it's relatively recent, maybe not as recent as the LLVM part, uh, but the H2O package itself is on trend. Uh, there's a great deal more to the software than the package, and, and uh, there's a, a menu-based environment and, and other, other kinds of things. But again, as with, with all three of these, the thing to do is, if you're interested, if it sounds like this might be useful for you, uh, go to the web, go to, go to the site, and find out more about what each of these is doing. <coughs> and so let's, let me just try to summarize what, where I think this, what I think the implications are general idea of interfaces with all these different examples. So RCP, RCPP and, and its modern version uh, generate interface calls to C++ uh, with less programming than the Dot call, in fact, much less programming than, than the conventional Dot call. So that means that you're, you're, you have available, first of all, uh, potentially vast uh, resources in terms of existing libraries in C++, but also you have an interface to a mechanism for programming yourself and making use of other software may require a little bit more work on your part. And that's, pro that's aided by uh, having a set of programming tools and enhancements of C++ making a lot of use of modern things like template programming and that language, which in effect, what that did create the modern inversion, my complete version of the interface language, which in this case is based on C++. So the LLVM for R, Specifically, the idea there is, is very focused. It's that you will compile uh, R language code, suitable idioms of, of, of the R language, into specialized points for either efficiency or perhaps for other, other goals as well. And with the H2O package, uh, again, uh, the key points are that uh, you're dealing with data in a different form. Uh, the, the data object you're dealing with are not R objects. They're compressed and highly efficient versions of certain specialized uh, classes, uh, particularly, specifically the data frame class uh, of objects in R. And that uh, using that data structure, you can then make use of existing uh, interface to functions corresponding to R functions, but uh, written in a very efficient, compressed form, making use of particular uh, computing models, specifically the ad Hadoop, uh, that will do certain computations so those, I think, are you know, the, it's very important to, to say that those are not all. There are lots of other, and you've, you've been hearing about, or will hear about some of them uh, in, in these talks. 
So there are lots of lots of good approaches to this general philosophy of interfaces that I'm promoting. Uh, and I think, uh, again, the bottom line is we need to use whatever is the best approach for a particular interface. So, it's all. So actually, it just turned out after the fact that uh, those three examples rather neatly uh, correspond to interfaces, efficiency, and big data. So I thought my title was well chosen. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is basically what I wanted to say. So interfaces are an integral part of the R. They always have been. Uh, if you want to deal with big data, if you want to deal with intense types of computation, uh, be prepared to explore why. Lots of, there's lots of useful new approaches to interfaces around. Uh, anybody who feels inclined and wants to work on extending them or developing new ones, believe me, it's a very valuable.